Hey everybody, Marcus here. This is the third and last installment in my series on exorcism and demonic possession. In the first video, we went through how possession occurs. In the second video, we talked about how possession is detected. In this video, I will go through what, according to Father Martin, occurs during the actual exorcism. Now, a subscriber of mine mentioned in a comment on my previous video that Netflix is putting out a documentary on Hostage to the Devil in the coming days. Now, this is a fortuitous coincidence, considering Hostage to the Devil is the book from which I have drawn the content for this video series. Hostage to the Devil was written by Father Malachi Martin in 1976, so to have a documentary emerge 41 years later, just as I independently chose to produce this series, is indeed kind of a cool coincidence. For those who are interested in the topic of this series and use Netflix, you might as well check out this documentary. Also, in one interview, Father Martin mentioned that the exorcism scenes from the movie, The Exorcist, are supposedly quite accurate, and the plot of the movie itself is based on a real-life exorcism. The movie, The Exorcist, was based on a true story from 1949. A 13-year-old boy was diagnosed as being possessed by the devil. And the Roman Catholic Church believed this enough to assign multiple exorcists to this case. A supposed total of 26 people have been said to have witnessed the horrible things that happened during these exorcisms. And it was apparently so terrifying to those who were involved that books were written about it and movies were made. Extensive notes were taken and kept of all the activities that took place over the three weeks of the exorcism. They were captured and published in a book called Possessed. The True Story of an Exorcism, by Thomas B. Allen. The case was so bad that the clergy had begun to give up hope on the salvation of the boy. The boy was not a baptized Catholic. Father Bodern, the main exorcist tasked with this case, decided that it might help to baptize the boy and have him take communion. The most violent of all incidents took place during this task. However, the baptism and communion only strengthened the resolve of the demon. It was a few days later, the boy having been in a rambling delirium up to that point, that the boy himself spoke clearly and lucidly for the first time in a while. The possessed boy spoke the following words, Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael, and I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits, to leave the body now. Now, to go into further detail about why this is significant, according to the Catholic belief, Saint Michael is the chief archangel in heaven. He is the angel whom God gave power over Satan, and he is also the angel who threw Lucifer from heaven and exiled him. Soon after the boy spoke this, he began to recover. The identity of the possessed boy has never been revealed. Now, before I dive into the subject at hand, I want to make a request for my audience. If you personally know an active or retired exorcist through your church community, I would love to be put into contact with such a person. It would be my intention to get them into an interview so that my subscribers could ask any questions they may have in relation to this subject. If I can secure such an interview, I would put out a short video canvassing the community to leave their questions in the comments section. I would then aggregate them and structure the interview in such a fashion as to have as many of them answered as possible. Indeed, there are questions of my own that I would like answered as well. But for now, let us get into the topic of this video. One of the most experienced exorcists I have known, and who was in fact the mentor of the exorcist in the first case related in this book, gave names to the various general stages of an exorcism. These names reflect the general meaning or effect or intent of what is happening, but not the specific means used by the evil spirit or by the exorcist. Connor, as I call him, spoke of presence, pretense, breakpoint, voice, clash, and expulsion. The events and stages these names signify occur in nine out of every ten exorcisms. From the moment the exorcist enters the room, a peculiar feeling seems to hang in the very air. From that moment, in any genuine exorcism and onward through its duration, everyone in the room is aware of, an, of some alien presence. This indubitable sign of possession is as unexplainable and unmistakable as it is inescapable. All the signs of possession, however blatant or grotesque, however subtle or debatable, seem both to pale before and to be marshaled in the face of this presence. There is no sure physical trace of the presence, but everyone feels it. You have to experience it to know it. You cannot locate it spatially beside or above or within the possessed, or over in the corner or under the bed or hovering in midair. In one sense, the presence is nowhere, and this magnifies its terror, 
because there is a presence, an other present, not a he or she or an it. Sometimes you think that what is present is singular, sometimes plural. When it speaks, as the exorcism goes on, it will sometimes refer to itself as I and sometimes as we. We'll use my and our, invisible and intangible. The presence claws at the humanness of those gathered in the room. You can exercise logic and expel any mental image of it. You can say to yourself, I'm only imagining this. Careful, don't panic. And there may be a momentary relief. But then, after a time lag of bare seconds, the presence returns as an inaudible hiss in the brain, as a wordless threat to the self you are. Its name and essence seem to be compounded a threat, to be only an intensely baleful, concentratedly intent on hate for hate's sake and on destruction for destruction's sake. In the early stages of an exorcism, the evil spirit will make every attempt to hide behind the possessed, so to speak, to appear to be one and the same person and personality with its victim. This is the pretense. The first task of the priest is to break that pretense, to force the spirit to reveal itself openly as separate from the possessed, and to name itself. For all possessing spirits are called by name that generally, though not always, has to do with the way that spirit works on its victim. As the exorcist sets about his task, the evil spirit may remain silent altogether, or it may speak with the voice of the possessed, and use past experiences and recollections of the possessed. This is often done skillfully, using details no one but the possessed could know. It can be very disarming, very pitiful. It can make everyone, including the priest, feel that it is the priest who is the villain, subjecting an innocent person to terrible rigors. Even the mannerisms and characteristics of the possessed are used by the spirit as its own camouflage. Sometimes the exorcist cannot shatter the pretense for days, but until he does, he cannot bring matters to a head. If he fails to shatter it at all, he has lost. Perhaps another exorcist replacing him will succeed, but he himself has been beaten. Every exorcist learns during pretense that he is dealing with some force or power that is at times intensely cunning, sometimes supremely intelligent, and at other times capable of crass stupidity, which makes one wonder further about the problem of singular or plural, and it is both highly dangerous and terribly vulnerable. Oddly, while this spirit or power or force knows some of the most secret and intimate details of the lives of everyone in the room, at the same time it also displays gaps in knowledge of things that may be happening at any given moment of the present. But the priest must not be lulled by small victories or take chances on hoped-for stupidities. He must be ready to have his own sins and blunders and weaknesses put into his mind or shouted in ugliness for all to hear. He must not make excuses for his past or wither as even his loveliest memories are fingered by ultimate filth and contempt. He must not be sidetracked by any way from his primary intention of freeing the possessed person before him, and he must at all costs avoid trading abuse or getting into any logical arguments with the possessed. The temptation to do so is more frequent than one might think, and must be regarded as a potential fatal trap that can shatter not only the exorcism, but quite literally shatter the exorcist as well. Accordingly, as the pretense begins to break down, the behavior of the possessed usually increases in violence and repulsiveness. It is as though an invisible manhole opens, and out of it pours the unmentionably inhuman and the humanly unacceptable. There's a stream of filth and unrestrained abuse, accompanied often by physical violence, writhing, gnashing of teeth, jumping around, sometimes physical attacks on the exorcist. A new hallmark of the proceedings enters as the breakpoint nears, and ushers in one of the more subtle sufferings the exorcist must undergo. Confusion. Complete and dreadful confusion. Rare is the exorcist who does not falter here for at least a moment, enmeshed in the peculiar pain of apparent contradiction of all sense. His ears seem to smell foul words. His eyes seem to hear offensive sounds and obscene screams. His nose seems to taste a high decibel cacophony. Each sense seems to be recording what another sense should be recording. Each nerve and sinew of onlookers and participants becomes rigid as they strive for control. Panic, the fear of being dissolved into insanity, runs in quick jabs through everyone there. All present experience this increasingly violent and confusing assault, but the exorcist is the one who rides the storm. He is the direct target of it all. 
the breakpoint is reached at that moment when the pretense has finally collapsed altogether. The voice of the possessed is no longer used by the spirit, though the new, strange voice may or may not issue from the mouth of the victim. The sound produced is often not even remotely like any human sound. At the breakpoint, for the first time, the spirit speaks of the possessed in the third person, as a separate being. For the first time, the possessing spirit acts personally and speaks of I or we, usually interchangeably, and of my and our, or mine and ours. Another very frequent sign that the breakpoint has been reached is the appearance of what Father Connor called the voice. The voice is an inordinately disturbing and humanly distressing babble. The first few syllables seem to be those of some word pronounced slowly and thickly, somewhat like a tape recording played at a subnormal speed. You are just straining to pick up the word and a layer of cold fear has already gripped you. You know this sound is alien, but your concentration is shattered and frustrated by an immediate gamut of echoes, of tiny, prickly voices echoing each syllable, screaming it, whispering it, laughing it, sneering it, groaning it, following it. They all hit your ear while the alien voice is going on unhurriedly to the next syllable, which you then try to catch while guessing at the first one you lost. By then, the tiny, jabbing voices have caught up with the second syllable, and the voice has proceeded to the third syllable, and so on. If the exorcism is to proceed, the voice must be silenced. It takes an enormous effort of will on the part of the exorcist, in direct confrontation with the alien will of evil, to silence the voice. The priest must get himself under control and challenge the spirit first to silence, and then to identify itself intelligibly. As in all things to do with exorcism of evil spirits, the priest makes this challenge with his own will, but always in the name and by the authority of Jesus and his church. To do so in his own name, or by some fancied authority of his own, would be to invite personal disaster. Merely human power, unadorned and without aid, cannot cope with the preternatural. It is to be remembered that when we speak of the preternatural, we are not speaking about what are known as poltergeists. Usually, at this point, and as the voice dies out, a tremendous pressure of an obscure kind affects the exorcist. This is the first and outermost edge of a direct and personal collision with the will of the kingdom, the clash. We all know from our personal experience that there can be no struggle of single personal wills without that felt and intuitive contact between two persons. There's a two-way communication that is as real as a conversation using words. The clash is the heart of a special and dreadful communication, the nucleus of this singular battle of wills between exorcist and evil spirit. Painful as it will be for him, the priest must look for the clash. He must provoke it. If he cannot lock wills with the evil thing and force that thing to lock its will in opposition to his own, then again, the exorcist is defeated. The issue between the two, the exorcist and the possessing spirit, is simple. Will the totally anti-human invade and take over? Will it, noisome and merciless, seep over that narrow rim where the exorcist would hold his ground alone and engulf him? Or will it, unwillingly, protestingly, under a duress greater than its single-track will, stop, identify itself, seed, retire, disappear, and be volatilized back into an unknown pit of being where no man wants to ever go? Even with all the pressure on him, and in fullest human agony, if the exorcist has got this far, he must press home. He has gained an advantage. He has already forced the evil spirit to come out on its own. If he has not been able to until now, he must finally force it to give its name. And then, some exorcists feel, the exorcist must pursue for as much information as he can. For in some peculiar way, as exorcists find, the more an evil spirit can be forced to reveal in the clash and its aftermath, the surer and easier will be the expulsion when that moment comes. To force as complete an identification as possible is perhaps a mark of domination of one will over another. It is of crucial interest to speculate about the violence provoked by exorcism, the physical and mental struggle that are so extreme they can bring on death. Why would spirits battle so? Why not leave and waft off invisibly to someone or someplace else? For spirit itself seems to suffer in these battles. Time and again, in exorcism after exorcism, there occurs that curious thing to do with spirit and place, 
the strange puzzle mentioned previously in connection with the room chosen for the exorcism. When Jesus expelled the unclean spirits, those spirits showed concern for where they might go. In record after record, as well as in several exorcisms recounted in this book, the possessing spirits wail and lament and questioning pain. Where shall we go? We too have to possess our habitation. Even the anointed one gave us a place with the swine. Here, we can't stay here any longer. The evil spirit, having found a home with a consenting host, does not appear to give up its place easily. It claws and fights and deceives and even risks killing its host before it will be expelled. How violent the struggle probably depends on many things. The intelligence of the spirit being dealt with and the degree of possession achieved over the victim are perhaps two one could speculate about. Whatever determines the actual pitch of violence, once the exorcist has forced the innovating spirit to identify itself and sustained the first worldless bout in the clash, and then in evoked its formal condemnation and expulsion by the exorcism rite, the immediate result is generally a struggle, tortuous beyond imagination, an open violence that leaves all subtly behind. The person possessed is by now obviously aware, in one way or another, of what possessed him. Frequently, he becomes a true battleground for much of the remainder of the exorcism, enduring unbelievable punishment and strain. It is sometimes possible for the exorcist to appeal directly to the possessed person, urging him to use some part of his own will still free of the spirit's influence and control, and engage directly in the fight, aiding the exorcist. And at such moments, no animal pinned helplessly to the ground struggles more pathetically against the drinking of its life's blood by voracious and superior cruelty. The very nauseous character of the possessed person's appearance and behavior appears to be a sign of his desire for deliverance, a desperate sign of struggle, evidence of a revolt where once he had consented. Increasingly, what had possessed him is being forced into the open, all the while protesting its victim's revolt and its own expulsion. The violence of the contortions and the physical disfigurement of the possessed can reach a degree one would think he could not possibly withstand. The exorcist, too comes in for full attack now. Once cornered, the evil spirit seems able to call on a superior intelligence and will try to lure the exorcist onto a field booby-trapped and mined with situations from which no human can extricate himself. Any weakness in the religious faith that alone sustains the exorcist or any fatigue will allow the exorcist's mind to be flooded with a terrible light he cannot fend off, a light that can burn the very roots of his reason and term him emotionally into the most servile of slaves, desperate to be liberated from all bodily life. These are only some of the dangers and traps that face every exorcist. His pain is physical, emotional, and mental. He has to deal with what is eerie, but not enthralling, with something askew, but intelligently so, with a quality that is upside down and inside out, but significantly so. The mordant traits of nightmare are there in full regalia but this is no dream and permits him no thankful remission. He is attacked by a stench so powerful that many exorcists start vomiting uncontrollably. He is made to bear physical pain, and he feels anguish over his very soul. He is made to know he is touching the completely unclean and totally inhuman. All sense may suddenly seem nonsense. Hopelessness is confirmed as the only hope. Death and cruelty and contempt are normal. Anything calmly or beautiful is an illusion. Nothing, it seems, was ever right in the world of man. He is in an atmosphere more bizarre than bedlam. If, in spite of his emotions and his imaginations and his body, all trapped at once in pain and anguish, if, in spite of all this, the will of the exorcist holds in the clash, what he does is to approach his final function in this situation as an authorized human witness for Jesus. By no power of his, on account of no privilege of his own, He calls finally on the evil spirit to desist, to be dispossessed, to depart, and to leave the possessed person. And, if the exorcism is successful, this is what happens. The possession ends. All present become aware of a change around them. The sense of presence is totally, suddenly absent. Sometimes there are receding voices or other noises. Sometimes only dead silence. Sometimes the recently possessed may be at the end of his strength. Sometimes he will wake up as if from a dream, a nightmare, or a coma. Sometimes the former victim will remember much of what he has been through. Sometimes he will remember nothing at all. Not so 
for the exorcists during and after their grisly work. They carry nagging doubts and bitter conflicts untellable to family, friends, superiors, or therapists. Their personal traumas lie beyond the reach of soothing words and deeper than the sweep of any consoling thoughts. They share their punishment with none but God. Even that has its peculiar sting of difficulty, for it is a sharing by faith and not by face-to-face communication. But only thus do these men, seemingly ordinary and commonplace in their lives, persevere through the days of quiet horror and the nights of sleepless watching they spent for years after as their price of success, and as abiding reminders that once upon a time another human being was made whole because they willingly incurred the direct displeasure of living hatred. Thanks for listening. Go team.